Perfect. Got it. Yeah. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, my guest today is Dr. Baxter Montgomery. He's not only one of my favorite plant-based doctors, but he has the best laugh of any plant-based doctor. And if you watched my show before and saw him being interviewed by Dr. Columbus Batiste, another plant-based cardiologist, the best story of how he got his first name than anybody I've ever met, please welcome him to the show. He has an exciting announcement about something he's been up to that is really wonderful. And we're gonna actually show you part of it today. Well, thanks for having me, Chef AJ, and it's always a pleasure to be with you here on your show, and uh, uh, I'll try to share my laugh with you. <laughs> I think you're able to get me to laugh several times uh, the last time, so I'm sure you'll <laughs> be able to get this time. But, you know, as you pointed out, we've been uh, doing a lot of work, and, and, and Montgomery Heart and Wells, for those of your guests who don't know me or haven't, you know, heard about us, um, you know, I'm a board certified cardiologist. I've been practicing the Houston area in the shadows of the world's largest medical center for years. Um, a little more than two decades ago, I learned about how natural uh, lifestyle changes can have a major impact on one's health. Um, but not only people who are relatively healthy who are trying to prevent disease, but, you know, in my practice, <clears throat> I see patients with severe advanced heart disease, severe advanced inflammatory diseases, diabetes and, and hypertension and, and uh, you name it. And so, you know, we see people at the, the end of the rope, if you will. And we started applying these aggressive lifestyle interventions on these patients and we saw amazing results. And, you know, this is more than two decades ago. We've since, you know, fully integrated into our practice with, you know, restaurant and, and grocery store. We've uh, you know, we've published uh, uh, papers and peer-reviewed journals showing the scientific validity of it. Uh, however, you know, despite our efforts and efforts of, you know, many of the other guests that you've had here, uh, you know, chronic illness continue to go on the rise. And, and, and it seems like a lot of people don't fully understand how uh, powerful lifestyle intervention can be. So what we uh, embarked on doing, uh, really the, the idea has been with us for since uh, 2009, and uh, we made some attempts early on, but in the last year, uh, we've embarked on putting together a docu-series. Uh, and essentially, uh, the docu-series, which we call Heart and Soul of a Champion, uh, is uh, designed to pull the curtains back on our operations at Montgomery Heart and Wellness and, and show uh, everyday citizens how lifestyle, integrative health, uh, is not only the future of medicine, but really is the present uh, course of medicine in places like ours and other places around the country. And we also want to impact on the everyday citizen how these simple lifestyle measures can have an immediate uh, drastic impact uh, on your health, even if you have advanced diabetes, advanced heart disease, and the like. Uh, and so it shows individuals going through changing their lives, uh, how this lifestyle impact their lives. Well, we show the, the, the good, we show triumphs and challenges. And so we give the true story behind this so that uh, you know the everyday citizen understands that, hey, I can make these changes starting today, starting tomorrow, and start to impact my life. I can take power and control over my health and therefore my life. Um, as we were mentioning before we came on, life expectancy in the United States have decreased by 2.7 years from 2019 to 2021, and it may have gone down even more in 2022. So we're in a healthcare crisis. Sickness is the norm. Six out of 10 individuals have a chronic illness. Uh, it's, it's very common for uh, young individuals uh, to have diabetes, heart disease. Uh, I'm seeing um, uh, individuals in their teens and 20s with heart failure you know, hypertension, hyper, hyperlipidemia, uh, inflammatory diseases, strokes. Uh, so we're just seeing all of these chronic illnesses. And, and um, I think if we just simply take control of our health, take control of the foods that we consume, we can have an impact on our lives individually, but also the lives of people around us and, and as a nation. Yeah, that would be great. 
I, I, how long did it take you to do the docu series, and how many episodes are there? How many seasons, and where can people watch it? We have a link for in the show notes for them to to purchase it. But tell us yes. a little bit about how it can be seen and how it was done. So we uh, it's been a little less than a year since we started filming, and uh, the first season has been released. We're actually actually working on season two. Yeah. Um, the number of seasons, I like to uh, think infinitely many seasons, and I'll kind of uh, explain that in a minute, but season one has eight episodes. Uh, season one is entitled Athletes Edition. And so what we did in season one is we uh, gathered a number of retired athletes, all of whom are about 20 years beyond their peak performance. And what I propose to do in season one is to set them on a course uh, uh, of lifestyle changes and intervention that's going to hopefully get them back near or at their peak performance level as in their prime. Now, this sounds like a crazy notion, uh, and, and I've done many things that sound crazy before. But the reason I think it's possible uh, is because we've seen individuals with severe chronic illness mm -hmm. to the point of being in hospice, to the point of being uh, on life support in some cases. And when we apply aggressive lifestyle intervention, these people are able to get up and walk and, and exercise, et cetera. So we can have someone at that level of metabolic and physiological deficits. And I think it's possible to get any, the individuals who have the under physiological undergirding of you know, uh, supreme athletic performance to get them to a level where they can perform at or near those levels again. And so that's what we had set out to do. So that's season one. Season two, which is uh, already under production, is gonna be dealing with chronic illness in women. Uh, we're thinking about season three, which will probably deal with diabetes. And you'll see individuals from earlier seasons, so some of the athletes, you'll probably see them show up in future seasons. So you'll get to know these individuals not only in a given season, but they'll come up in later seasons showing their uh, lifestyle journey because we're going to set everybody on a lifetime lifestyle journey toward optimal health and optimal physiological performance. That sounds fantastic. Who 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 shot the docu series and how did you find you know the people that were in it? So um, I uh, there was um, I started out with uh, some individuals in uh, the Los Angeles area area. Um, a friend of Chef Babette, Tara Bennett, helped us out in getting started. Um, and there's a number of individuals. We got an editing crew that helped us with editing and also post-production, um, uh, filming and storytelling. Uh, Julian uh, McKenna uh, was a key leader in there. His company's out of New York. Uh, we recruited athletes like... Um, uh, Raymond Wadi, a former cornerback for the Washington, then Washington Redskins, now the Commanders. Uh, we got uh, a former world-class high jumper, Kenny Banks. Um, we got an individual who played quarterback at a, a level one school, D1 school in college, uh, Wendell Mosley. And we got Pro Football Hall of Famer, Daryl Green, uh, to come and participate. And then there were a number of other patients and people who were in the Film Mark Scorette, a uh, former NFL uh, player who was uh, offensive tackle with the Redskins and then the Denver Broncos. Uh, and so he's uh, featured in there and there was a number of other individuals who uh, were not uh, retired athletes who came and participated. And um, we showed how they their lives were changed as well. That's great. Was it fun? Uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work and a lot of fun. And uh, you're going to see, and I'm going to have to give a disclaimer. I was out working out with the uh, guys, uh, but I, I was working out with an injury. I had a hamstring, it's like micro tears on my hamstring. But despite that, I said, I got to get out of here, get in front of the camera. So I'm a little stiffer and slower than some of those guys were. And, and you know, they start out in pretty amazing shape. And that's why I'm pretty confident that we're gonna get them uh, at the level. One of the guys already performing at a high level in terms of 40 yard dash, uh, and we're still working with them. So I think you're gonna see a lot of uh, good things happen, but you're gonna see you know a few bumps in the road as well. Nice, would, uh, would you like me to start playing it now? Yeah, what I'd like to do, we can show episode one and uh, let your audience take a look and then um, we can fire away with questions after that. That sounds great. Okay, guys, I'm gonna share my screen. Enjoy the show.
Over the 25 years of practicing cardiology and internal medicine, I've treated patients with many, many advanced diseases. Following these patients, despite the advancement of technology that we've had, the patients continue to get sicker and sicker. In my busy practice, my health started to decline. I started noticing that my cholesterol went up, my blood pressure was up, and I did not want to take the same therapies I was prescribing other patients. Um, Dr. Baxter Montgomery, and I've been practicing the world's largest medical center for more than a quarter of a century. Our center is quite unique. The Montgomery Heart and Wellness Center is located here in Houston, Texas. We have state-of-the-art diagnostic and therapeutic tools. I have a background in biochemistry. I have medical specialties in internal medicine, cardiovascular disease, and cardiac electrophysiology. So I started doing my own research. I got into nutrition. I ran across a local individual who was an expert in doing nutritional detox. And I went through a natural detox and cleansing my system over a period of 32 days. In that period of time, I felt amazing. I felt like I was 18 years old at the age of 35. This caused a light bulb to go off. If this could cause me to improve, this could have an impact on my patients. The body has the ability to heal itself when properly nursed, rested, and hydrated. We know this is effective in getting people back on their feet. However, I have a hypothesis that this intervention is even more powerful than that. This intervention, I think, can get people back to peak level of performance. So we brought together a group of athletes who have performed at peak levels at some time in their life. And we're gonna work these athletes, despite the fact that they're coming in with chronic ailments such as high blood pressure, heart failure, arthritis, and many other chronic illnesses. It is our impression that this intervention not only will help their bodies reverse these chronic illnesses, but it will also help their body get back to a level of peak performance. If you can go back and turn the clock, go back to a time when you were at your peak performance, would you do that? This is Heart and Soul of a Champion, Athletes Edition, Season 1. I've been working with Wendell Mosley for several months. And I thought based on the previous findings, he would be a perfect candidate for this program. He had gone through our detox program successfully. However, there are a few setbacks that he had that affected him emotionally. So I didn't really start playing football until like the sixth grade. By the time I was in the 11th, 12th grade, now I was getting a lot better. And you know, into a starting position on the high school football team. Cousin of mine that gave me a call one day and said, man, you know, are any schools still recruiting you? He said, well, I got a place that wants to look at you. I said, wow, let's do it. So he said, yeah, so I got a coach up at University of North Texas. And so I walked on after my first semester there, I earned a full scholarship. Senior year is when I actually started and led the team. His initial reason for seeing us was that he had had a previous diagnosis of prostate cancer. So he underwent the prostatectomy. He had a successful procedure. And so he was seeing us after the fact. However, despite him having gone through the surgery successfully and doing well, some of the numbers were not looking ideal. And his urologists were telling him that, hey, maybe we're going to have to put you on hormones or some other type of medical therapy. And when he asked him again about lifestyle changes, he was given no answer. And he was feeling demoralized. Oftentimes patients are just focused on, well, my numbers are going up. And he was just focused, well, the numbers are going up. So I'm going to get the other test. What is the next test show? What is the next test show? 
I wanted to get him out of this mindset. I wanted to get him out of this frame of work. I wanted to get him back on the football field, on the gridiron, to take him back to a time where, where he had other goals. I wanted to put him in a space of going after goals beyond improving laboratory tests. This was going to put him in a different mental space. This was going to help him heal his mindset about his disease state. So I've known Kenny Banks for a while and met him through his work with hyperbaric oxygen therapy and had worked out with him once or twice. And I knew that he was physically fit. My name is Kenny Banks, 55 years old. I'm a former world-class high jumper and competed on a professional track circuit in the 80s to the mid 90s. Been in sports pretty much all of my life. Tried out for a couple Olympics. Love to still work out and stay active. And that's just a big part of my daily routine and sports and athletics keeps me healthy. When I started this project, my idea was to have him come in and push the rest of the group because I knew he was fit to be fit. However, here we are on day one. His blood pressure looks great. But after doing a stress test, my PA notifies me that he has a significantly abnormal stress test. And when I reviewed the stress test, it had very significant EKG changes consistent with coronary disease. My concern is that someone like him being seen by a typical cardiologist would be scheduled for a coronary angiogram and a possible stent placement. The question is, is Kenny Banks at risk for heart attack or even sudden cardiac death. Our initial evaluation of Daryl Green when he came in, he seemed to be in pretty good shape. He didn't have any significant symptoms. He didn't have any symptoms of chest discomfort or shortness of breath. He had pretty good energy level. So I felt that he would be someone that we'd be able to start off with and start getting you know to that higher level. I am a former professional football player, 20 years in the NFL, with the team formerly known as the Washington Redskins, presently known as the Commanders. Our problems with Daryl Green is that he presents to us with, number one, reporting that he is not in the doctor in 15 to 20 years. And the problem with that is that he essentially has no baseline data for us to evaluate. The other problem that he presents us with is that he's lived a standard American lifestyle from a dietary standpoint. He does exercise from time to time, but he hasn't exercised in about two years based on his report, at least not on a regular basis. I'd like to live long. I'd like to live long because I'd like to have an extended impact on the world. Super Bowls, all the fame, all that, all that stuff is great because that's a tool in my hand. That's what drives me. So if I can be healthy and be there and participate and use even some of the foolish things of this world, run fast at 62 and people go, ah, then I got, I got a conversation with you. Upon the initial set of vital signs, my staff came to me and told me that his initial blood pressure was 191 over 114. So that raised my eyebrows. When a patient comes with a blood pressure, like Daryl Green has, 191 over 114. This is a blood pressure that's at a level that's considered stroke level. Nine times out of 10, or maybe nine and a half times out of 10, a doctor will send you straight to the emergency room, especially if it's a clinical setting where you cannot get CT scans or other types of imaging. This is a medical emergency. This is the type of blood pressure that doctors typically treat urgently in the hospital, in an emergency room right away. The other thing we found is that Daryl Green has blood vessel disease. Now, we refer to this as endothelial dysfunction. Essentially, what that means that he has blood vessel disease, which could mean he's predisposed to a heart attack or stroke or some other type of vascular problem. When I started this project, I had the goal, the vision to take retired athletes and take them to a level of physical performance 
that was either near or at their previous peak levels of performance. The tricky part about Daryl Green is that my scientific mind is struggling with my human football fan mind. My scientific mind, my medical mind, is saying this individual is at risk for heart attack, stroke, sudden cardiac death. My sports fan mind is saying this person is physically fit. This person can run a 4-3-40. This person is superhuman. And I'm struggling within with this individual. And I know that nearly half of the individuals with cardiovascular disease present with sudden cardiac death as a first symptom. And now we have to make a decision. Should that be send them to the emergency room or not? I met Raymond Rewati through Daryl Green the night before the first visit. Daryl calls me and says, you know, hey, I have this friend, Raymond Wadi, and I just found out after talking to a mutual friend of his that he was recently diagnosed with condensed heart failure. So last night we talked and I talked to Raymond. His wife is on the phone through speakerphone, and I just shared with him that I think, you know, what we do can help. And so he decided to come in. He still wasn't sure what he wanted to do even after coming. However, he completed our intake form. And as of now, he tells me he's all in. Most of the people that know me call me Ray. If you really know me, they call me Stack because that means I grew up with you. And probably more known as Coach, Coach Wilder. I was fortunate enough to earn a scholarship to go to college to play football. I was an undrafted free agent, signed with the Washington Redskins, and ended up being fortunate enough to make the team and spent a little over three years with them. So I ended up going to the St. Louis Cardinals, getting released, uh, the last cut. I left there and came back to Texas and student taught. Left Kingsville and went to Canada and played in the CFL with Edmonton and British Columbia. So that's Canada came back to the States and newly formed the United States Football League and finished my career in, in 84 in San Antonio. So Mr. Ray Mawadi comes in and I look at him. He has a, a very, very distinctive lip. He's obese. He is wearing an external defibrillator. But he's not the perfect picture of health. My concern with managing a patient with heart failure is that we have two major problems with heart failure. One major problem is that heart failure patients can become very ill and die from overall poor circulation. We call that pump failure. Overall poor circulation leads to kidney failure, liver failure, GI failure, and brain dysfunction. And individuals in this condition are very, very sick and very, very hard to manage. And the other situation with heart failure is that heart failure patients are at risk for sudden cardiac arrest. One minute they're up talking to you, the other minute they collapse in death. So sudden cardiac death or slow pump failure. These are two very difficult things that we deal with patients with heart failure. Raymond Wadi's heart failure is so bad that he has to walk around with a device about the size of a transistor radio to monitor his heart in the event he suffers with cardiac arrest. In 2019, I was diagnosed with cancer after having a complete hysterectomy. Talking about a good husband, he was there with me from start to finish. We cried together, we prayed together, but we got through it. It was it was very hard. Some of the things that I went through, some men couldn't stand. It. He stood and he stood with me. I tell you that that's God. That that's a godly man and a loving husband. And we've had other challenges. I lost my bonus son. He was my godson, but I call him my bonus son in January of twenty twenty one. He was hit by a car. That was devastating to me, and he was only 29 years old. April of 2021, I lost my dad. 
in January of 2022, I lost my only grandson that was 17. I'm still having a hard time from both of those, and he's been right there by my side. So, you know, it's been a lot for me. I lost my brother. In March. In March, to brain cancer. Leading up to before I was diagnosed, I had been feeling very tired, very fatigued, and I started having shortness of breath. And so my wife said, well, you need to get an appointment. So I got an appointment with my PCP. He did a EKG and they found an arrhythmia, uh, abnormal heart rhythm. So he sent me to the cardiologist. The cardiologist called me in and told me that I had congestive heart failure. That was a lot to unpack. When we got that news, we were both just like dumbfounded. It was just a lot of un unknown uncertainties. What did that mean, congestive heart failure? Is my mom going to have a heart attack? Uh, is my heart going to stop working? Uh, which basically is the combination of all those things that could happen. The most important thing to notice about Wadi, he has this continence, this spatial continence of hopelessness. That is the most worrisome symptom that he has, in my opinion. That symptom is the, the most difficult symptom to deal with with any patient. When a patient has lost hope, then that patient is a patient very difficult to treat. My main intervention with Raymond Wadi on day one has been to introduce a sense of hope and direction. What we're doing with him today, A, come up with a game plan for healing your heart. This is the strategy, and this is our plan for victory. I'm taking him back on the football field and I'm giving them a plan for victory. This time, the victory is to heal his heart. While doing his treatment on the ECD bed, I walked up to him and I said, well, what was your best time in the 40-yard dash? He told me it was 4.49 seconds. And I said, oh, great, that's your goal. Your goal is 4.49 seconds. Now, he looked at me and laughed with a look, hey, this sounds ridiculous. I said, no, I had a very serious face. I had a very, I'm very serious. Your goal is 449. And I talked to my staff and I explained what we were doing. I said, look, Mr. Raymond Wadi's best time in a 40 yard dash was 449. Our goal for him is 449. Every time you see him, I want you to say 449. It's a realistic goal. It's a goal that we want him to make his own goal, even if it's lifelong goal, 449. One thing we've dealt with in our approach to treating patients with chronic illnesses is a paradigm shift in our thinking in terms of how people should age compared to how we currently age. If we look at individuals who are aging, who are developing chronic illnesses, our natural thought process, or at least our current thought process is there's a debilitation over time. Similarly with athletes, but the everyday individual. But what we've come across is a different way of thinking about this based on our historical clinical evidence and clinical experience. The paradigm shift that we have come to is that individuals should improve their performance over time, not decline. Because seeing how individuals with severe illnesses who are on death's door can turn around and be revitalized, can we get retired athletes to function at their peak level of performance when they were very young regardless of their baseline medical condition. That's what we aim to see 
these athletes are going to be surprised at the accomplishments that they will make during this program. Maybe this is something that can help me down here. I just think it's something that prayerfully that would be a benefit to me and other people as well. I'm excited. I'm going to try to do this. It'll be interesting, though, to see what the change is from where I have started my baseline. Right? So that will be an interesting part to see. Essentially, the illnesses that Mr. Banks, Green, Mosley, and Wadi are dealing with kill more people every year in the United States than all the deaths that we've lost from American soldiers in the United States history. Okay. Over the 25 years of practice. That was amazing. You are very good on camera. <laughs> well, very new at it. Did, did the music, um, I'm so sure you heard it on your side. I'll check with your guests and see how the clear the music was. There was some, the music was spotty on my side. I could hear it perfectly. Did you, got some, did you guys hear it well? Tell me. I thought the music was one of my favorite parts of the whole thing. It was, I just felt like I was watching an actual TV show or movie. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, it was really good. I was looking at the credits. The first time I watched it, I didn't watch the credits, I'll be honest. And culinary staff, there was like 10 people. Yeah, yeah. The culinary staff has uh, picked up. My son has really gone in and grown the kitchen. Uh, you know, we're shipping food across the country. Uh, we have a grocery store, and he's really gotten things organized there. So yeah, it's uh, it's it's really he's improved the operation. We we got more work to do, but it's, it's coming along. Somebody's asking if it's available outside the United States. It's you can get it anywhere because it's That's virtual. Great. That's correct. Yes. Yes. Some of our community people, uh, they go to uh, heart and soul of a champion dot com. Uh, they can buy it. I'm going to I'm going to put that link in the chat as well as the show notes. How are these athletes doing now? So they're doing quite well. I'm not going to uh, uh, spoil anything, but uh, I'll say that we made good progress. Uh, we showed the ups and downs of their journey throughout the episodes, but uh, it was it was quite interesting. And there's uh, uh, some other people. Mark Sclaret comes in, and and uh, some other people come in and introduce uh, throughout the show. And so we, it's it's um, our editors and storytellers worked very well with us to to weave their stories into the stories of other people who showed up, who we evaluated. Because essentially, what we do is we, you know, this is. Um, it's it's quasi reality TV because you know these are real patients of ours, <clears throat> and even though these athletes were chosen, uh, there are other people who are in this season and also future season are patients who just come to us from anywhere in the world uh, who uh, have health challenges that uh, we help them uh, uh, overcome. So uh, as you uh, not only get into this season, you'll get into other seasons. See the the different patients that we see. Uh, who come with uh, lots of uh, health issues in season two, the number of women. Um, there's a um, uh, patient, uh, uh, a lady who's going to bring her mother from overseas or two people from overseas who are coming over uh, and uh, people who are being evaluated and treated. So you're seeing the variety of conditions that we see. You know, some of the people said the music was breaking up, but I think that's a Zoom thing. And Zoom does that on purpose, because now that I think about it, when I've had professional musicians on the show, it is, I think that's a Zoom thing. But the, the quality of the of the series is great. So don't worry about that. I like when you go like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the head of Pulse. And we shot that thing so many times. <laughs> yeah, no, you look great. And I didn't realize what a great athlete you were. That weight you were lifting looked like it was pretty heavy. 
Yeah, I, I'm going to have to make a comeback. I was very stiff and slow, but thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that, that was amazing. Uh, did the people in the docuseries, uh, did they, do, you, do you keep up with them and have they stayed plant-based? Yes, they're real patients. Uh, they've done quite well. Um, and, you know, uh, just like any patients, uh, everybody have the ups and downs. And so we start them on a very uh, rigid regimen. And as you see through the season one, uh, it's a raw diet, time-restricted eating. Uh, they're working out a lot, uh, but we're doing medical interventions, evaluations. Uh, you know, sometimes we have to interrupt things. We have to change our plans based on how they respond. And so all of these things, you see how we make changes. So, you know, and one thing we wanted to reveal, because often in the plant-based world, and, you know, we've shown some wonderful documentaries uh, over the years, but oftentimes, and, 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 and you know, I'm, I'm guilty of this too, you'll show before and after, but there's a lot of complexities in the in-between and, and there's a fair amount of back and forth. And we, we show that and how we deal with it and how the, uh, the athletes dealt with it. Nice. I know, are there other plant-based cardiologists? I know there are, but in Houston where you practice or are you pretty much the only one? I'm the only one in Houston that I know of. Um, I'm, I'm pretty certain. Yeah, it's a you know it's a big community, but it's small enough to know if there was someone else like me, another weirdo like me, I think I would know. So I, I don't know of any other plant based cardiologists. Nice. Well, what do your colleagues think of you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they say behind my back. I, I always start with that, but you know, for the most part, I'm treated with respect. I mean, <clears throat> one thing, uh, and I've always point this out, uh, I did start off in this journey. So, you know, being, you know, board certified internist and cardiologist and cardiac electrophysiologist with all the sub sub specialty training and, and working in the field and seeing, you know, these very complex patients, um, you know, the colleagues, my colleagues have seen me work in that arena. So it's like, okay, he's one of us working in this arena. Now, um, when I started making these changes and started doing, you know, a, applying a different approach, uh, yeah, questions were raised. And um, I imagine some people saying, what's gotten into to Baxter? He's lost his mind. <laughs> but, but, you know, they have to, one, they can't uh, deny the positive results we get. And so a number of colleagues refer patients to us, um, you know, um, you know, one of the, the, um, athletes there, um, uh, his mother was referred to us uh, by a cardiothoracic surgeon. Uh, and so, you know, we get patients referred to us by uh, cardiologists and other specialists who know patients need an aggressive intervention. Uh, and when patients ask about a natural approach, oftentimes uh, physicians will think of me and they'll refer patients. That's great. Hey, are you up to a few questions, either ones that were submitted or some live? Absolutely. Okay. Well, we always give deference and thank the people that do write in in advance. So we'll do, there's a couple of those. We'll do these first. And this one is from Sharon and she wanted to know, Dr. Montgomery, do you know of a doctor or a naturopath or any alternative healer that's well-trained with herbs and supplements? Oh, gosh. Um, um, there are a number of people out there. I can't say that I know the name of someone who checks all of those boxes. Um, you know, we use herbalists uh, to work, help us out. I'm not going to say I'm trained in herbal medicine. Most of the doctors I know are they're functional medicine doctors who are not nutritional. There are no nutritional doctors who are not functional medicine or not herbalists. So I, my answer to that is I don't know of anyone off the top of my head. But if I come up with someone, I'll pass it on to you, Chef AJ. You can share it in the notes. You know, I have a regular doctor on this show named Dr. Sunil Pai, and I think he might be the one the type of doctor she's looking for so please okay. check him out on my channel and he even does virtual consults so thank you this okay. next question is from mt please ask dr montgomery if he thinks developing new collateral blood flow around blockages is a key or common part of reversing heart disease or is it more of a rare event and if anything can be done to improve the odds of developing collateral circulation well, collateral circulation development is common. We see it, uh, you know, thousands of patients have calf. We see collateral circulations uh, frequently. 
Uh, it happens in the coronary arteries of the heart. It has some peripheral vasculature. So collateral circulation is, uh, is common. It's the body's natural adaptive uh, approach to um, healing itself, if you will. Um, <clears throat> you know, doing things that's going to improve production of nitric oxide, it's going to decrease inflammation, decrease oxidative stress, is going to help your body adapt in a positive way to reverse illness. So depending on how advanced your disease is, uh, if you have early atherosclerosis or soft plaque, the, the primary you know stenosis can regress. You may not need. Uh, collateral circulation. If you have an old calcified lesion and have some collateral circulation, your mighty body may elect to enhance collateral circulation to further improve um, uh, a positive adaptive uh, uh, behavior toward uh, reversing that condition. So it all depends on the level of advancement of your disease. Great. Thank you. Here is a question from somebody live named Billy. I just saw it. It was about nuts. And always, it's always an issue. Here it is. Um, he's asking, uh, where to go? I am, a, I am normal weight with no health problems. Do nuts harm heart and artery health or are they healthy? Well, unhealthy nuts by definition are unhealthy. Um, you know, you always want to be careful with the nuts you consume. Uh, first and foremost, you know, the, be selective. I, if I have someone eat nuts, it'd be raw pistachios or raw walnuts. Uh, I mean, nuts are healthy. I, I emphasize making sure they're raw, ideally organically grown. If you can sprout them, that's good. So, you know, if you don't have a weight problem and you don't have lipid problems, then you can enjoy nuts. Even people with weight problems can do it. They have to be more careful than people without weight problems. Uh, you know, seeds, I have a preference for seeds over nuts to a certain extent. You know, um, they have a large amount of omega-3, you know, chia seeds. Uh, flax seeds, you know, hemp seeds, those are all great seeds that you can consume. You can make sauces with them uh, and, and, and the like. So uh, seeds, nuts can be healthy. You just have to be very selective, uh, careful in how you select them, I should say. That sounds good. Are, are you a fan of supplementation with like, you know, that not fish oil, but the, the plant-based version of it, DHA, I believe? Yeah, there, there are different ways you can get it. We use a uh, green algae, um, uh, and, and we we really promote uh, consumption of uh, sea vegetables. But like a blue green algae E3 Live uh, is loaded with uh, the omega three, and we uh, encourage our patients to consume the green algae uh, by itself. Now, if you know we have you know omega three ratios that are off, and and what have you, and someone needs extra help, we may go to supplementation, but We've rarely found that to be the case. Once we put them on a clean diet, the supplement with uh, algae uh, foods, the whole foods, uh, in our experience, typically have been enough. And then, of course, you get chia seeds and other types of things that have omega-3, that are good omega-3 sources. Great. Thank you. Uh, Nick says, should we go by the BMI chart for the weight of a person? You know, BMI is a nice gross um, uh, assessment. It's, um, you know, most, it's a simple calculation to do. Um, but, you know, like any one measurement, you should let it be the uh, end all be all. I mean, somebody has a BMI of, you know, 55 and, you know, that's off the chart and you want to work on getting that down. You know, if your BMI is 25 or 22, uh, then you're probably okay. I mean, especially if you have a BMI of 25 or 26 and you're very muscular, you work out a lot, you very have a thin waistline and you're very lean, but you're muscular because muscle is going to be denser. So you may have a higher BMI for your height than someone who has a lower BMI, but who doesn't have uh, as much muscle. Uh, body composition is probably a more important parameter, but it's a little bit harder to measure. Uh, however, you should know that, let's say if your BMI is normal, but you don't exercise, you have no muscle tone, you don't lift weights, you're very weak and so on, then you know that you probably have a you know, high amount of uh, fat uh, composition. So your body composition is abnormal. So you really want to look at body compositions as a preference. BMI, even though it's easy to look at and measure, uh, is something that you, you know, look at in the context of other aspects of your health parameters. So you're saying it's like really the percentage of body fat that's more important than the actual. 
That, that, that's exactly right. You want a low percent of body fat and, uh, and, and again, low percent of body fat and a hydration level. I mean, uh, hydration, water content, spotted body composition. And so if you walk around and I know hydration fluctuates in, at a greater rate uh, than uh, fat composition, but it's still very important. And so, you know, body composition in general, yes, low percent body fat, you know, high muscle mass, high amount of hydration, those things are important. Where does one, what is the best test or where does one go to get body fat analysis? Because I don't think those home scales are that accurate. Do you? You know, um, they may not be accurate in the absolute sense, but if you, if you're using one scale and you, you know, use it as say, okay, here's my baseline and my fat percentage is, you know, in and in is high. And then I work out and improve my diet and do these things and so on. And N becomes N divided by two or one half N, then, okay, that's a good, you know, uh, trajectory. So even though the actual number N may not be the actual ideal or, or correct or accurate measure, instead of, you know, 22%, maybe it's 17% or 25%. But if it's cut in half, it's cutting half and using the same measuring device. So, you know, if you have one of these home devices, you're right, they're probably not the most accurate, but if that's the best you can do, you can use that as a single measure and measure your trajectory over time. I remember when I was 20, that was like over 40 years ago at the gym, they used to like dunk you in this tank. Yep, yep. They, they, uh, I've done that. When I was in college, they did uh, uh, caliper measurements. That's thought to be the second most accurate. Uh, the submersion test is thought to be the most accurate with the exception of say, maybe an autopsy, but that's another story. Oh. But um, <laughs> what about the BIA? Have you heard of the bioimpedance analysis where they put the electrodes on you, you're laying down and supposedly yeah. that measures hydration that, as well? They, but you have different devices that measure impedance. You have the handheld device, the total body bioimpedance measurements. And those things work pretty well. You know, you probably measure them against the submersion device. And I don't know how, they've been validated, but uh, there are, again, a lot of ways of doing it. Um, you, you want to choose some way that you can get repeated measures over time. So let's say if you're fortunate enough to have access to a gym where someone's trained to do the caliper test or submersion test, you compare that number to say your home uh, scale impedance test, and that's your baseline, then you can see that change over time, but you just want to measure that uh, those things over time. Uh, and so that's key because, you know, wherever you start, uh, you want to, if it's a good number, you want to maintain it. If it's a bad number, you want to improve it. Great. And Sherry says, does a plant-based diet help with AFib and the electrical system of the heart? Husband is about to have his third ablation last week, next week. And before you answer, even if it doesn't, what's the alternative? Because we know that an animal-based diet and a processed food diet certainly won't. <laughs> yeah. Well, as an electrophysiologist, I've been I've done these AFib ablations uh, about t over 20 years ago, and uh, you know the the technology has improved, etc. You know they the ablations can be beneficial in in some situations as an adjunct. Uh, what I know about the plant based diet, it reduces inflammation, uh, reduces oxidative stress, and these are things that feed into AFib. We've had clinical scenarios where we see patients have reduced the amount of AFib based on their diet. Um, if someone's having a third AFib ablation, I, I tend to raise an eyebrow with that because typically you don't wanna do more than two, at least in my opinion. Uh, but once you get in doing more scars, you can get you know, scarring and stiffening of the atrium because you know, the atrium can, has to be flexible enough to contract and relax as well. So if it's scarred up from multiple ablations, then um, you know, there can be problems there. Uh, but, but certainly with um, the plant-based diet, it's really the key, and in, in, in the medical literature, uh, the most effective treatment for AFib has been diet and exercise. And that's, that's without consideration of a plant-based diet, but we know that most healthier diets consist of a greater consumption of plant foods. And so um, a plant-based diet, I'm pretty certain, can uh, improve your chance of controlling AFib. How many people just wait till they get sick to change their diet, don't they? Well, that's that's the unfortunate thing, and 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 that's what we're dealing with. I mean, that's those are the cards we're dealt as a society. Uh, you know, most of us are reactive, and you know that's understandable. But 
you know, even in that situation, if you are dedicated enough and you're aggressive enough with it, uh, you can make changes. And so that's a critical factor. Yep. Well, better late than never. That's correct. <laughs> uh, Lupe says, <laughs> see, I told you you had a great laugh. She says, so you always advise a patient to have an umbrella surgery for a PFO after a stroke, even if the patient has completely turned their diet and weight around? Well, the umbrella surgery in terms of closing off the PFO, you know, that's a standard recommendation. Now, I don't always recommend that. It's just part of the treatment regimen. And even in those situations, and just for the, so the audience understand, uh, PFOs are known as a patent foramen ovale. That's a, an opening that's between the atria. And so it's a window that normally closes, you know, just prior to birth. For some people, it doesn't fully close or seal. And so there's a potential opening between the right side of the upper chamber to the left side. And so individuals who develop blood clots in the lower extremity who would normally get a blood clot that goes to the lung, which we call a pulmonary embolism, if the blood clot goes to the right side, instead of going to the pulmonary artery, they can take a shortcut from the upper chamber in the right to the upper chamber in the left. Once it gets to the upper chamber in the left, then it has access to the arterial side, and then it can go up to the brain and cause a stroke. And so in certain situations, uh, individuals who are young, who've had strokes, uh, if they're found to have an opening, that opening called a pain frame or valley or PFO, then that becomes an indication of closing it. And they use a, a catheter procedure and it looks like an umbrella. That's what you're talking about, umbrella. So that's typically the procedure that's used to, to seal up that opening in, in theory, preventing another stroke. However, in these individuals, you cannot exclude the possibility that the stroke caused by some other mechanism. So while it's a common recommendation, I'm not going to say it's always recommended. It all depends on other things that are going on with the patient. Uh, they may have had other strokes. They may have atrial fibrillation. Uh, they may have, you know, atherosclerotic chronic disease or uh, a cerebral vascular disease. So it depends on what else is happening, depending on what uh, you would do with a PFO. Great. She said her stroke was in her brain. And were there, I, I, this, Beth says, what was the wheatgrass juice in the little juice shots? Oh, that's the blue green algae, E3 Live. It wasn't wheatgrass, it's E3 Live, it's the blue green algae. Right, thanks. Linda says, what does Dr. Montgomery think about a one inch square of 85% cacao dark chocolate per day for heart health? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love Dr. Goldhammer to take that one too. I like some cacao chocolate. I mean, my goodness, you got it measured out. <laughs> you know, if you like cacao chocolate, I think that's fine. I'm not sure it's in this a requirement for heart health, but if it's, you know, raw cacao has a lot of benefits. It's rich in magnesium is one thing. It's a lot of people magnesium deficient. So if it's, if it's raw cacao uh, and it's bitter, then that's great. We, we have cacao chip nibs that we sprinkle on our salads and the like. So cacao can be part of a healthy diet. Uh, you know, I'm not sure about that precise measurement. Maybe you can have more, maybe you can have left, but less. But cacao is a very good source of magnesium among other minerals. And, and that's certainly good for heart health among other things. Great, thank you. And here's a question uh, from Mariana. Do you do virtual consultations? Yes, if you go to our website, MontgomeryHeart.com, at the very top, it talks about our online community. And uh, for our non-medical um, <clears throat> interaction, the online community is the best way to go. Uh, the medical consultation on the medical side, uh, because I'm in the state of Texas, our board requires that we see the patient at least once in person for an initial visit to establish doctor-patient relationship. And then if you fly back to your state, we can continue to follow up. Uh, we have a digital health uh, clinic uh, and uh, we do follow up calls to our digital health uh, uh, clinic, uh, digital health center program. So we have it through our wellness, through our online community. We have online coaching. Through the online community, if you were to register and if you go to montgomeryheart.com forward slash journey, uh, you can um, see the online community directly if you sign up for the um, 
the inner circle, that's where you have all the live interaction. We have a lot of Zoom calls of being experts, you know, like Chef AJ, Chef and other scientists and, and medical doctors. And I'm on once a month, we have a stump to chump. And so people take advantage of that. They ask me questions pretty much like you're asking now. It sounds like a game show, Stump the Chump. That's right. <laughs> I'm the chump once a month. That's hilarious. So uh, Sherry, who asked the question, says that her husband is mostly plant-based, but of course, her regular cardiologist says that diet doesn't impact the electrical system. So he cheats a lot. He is very stubborn and becoming 100% plant-based. Never heard that before from a man. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, yeah it, it does affect the electrical system. I, it, I mean, I, I've seen this uh, a lot. And so as an electrophysiologist who plant, practice plant-based nutrition, I monitor these things in patients. So I'm pretty confident that it affects the electrical system. Great. And Charles would like to know, is the treatment for heart problems the same from a plant-based cardiologist as from a traditional cardiologist? That's a great question. The answer is yes and no. Uh, the yes part is if uh, the person, you know, is in severe, you know, health problems. So they have advanced heart disease and they don't want to follow the plant-based diet or other lifestyle things. And not only we apply a plant-based diet, but we use other natural interventions such as sauna therapy, external counterpulsation therapy. We use ozone therapy. We're starting to use methylene blue. These are other adjunct therapies in addition to target supplementation. So we use uh, uh, those therapies in the context of helping people reverse their disease. If someone elects not to comply with that approach, then we're only left with the traditional medical way, largely because <clears throat> if a patient comes and see me and they have congestive heart failure and they've had a stroke or whatever the case is, and you know, I would say, well, you know, let's do some things to reverse your heart failure. Let's do some things to normalize your cholesterol, et cetera. Uh, but if they're not willing to comply with those things, then I'm forced to treat them by what's considered standard guidelines or guideline-directed medical therapy or standard of care. Uh, because, you know, we have, there's a liability issue and these things that we have to consider always. Great. Thank you. <laughs> All right, that's cool. I'm just so sorry. There's just lots of nice comments in the chat. Oh. <laughs> do, you, do you have a screening for this? Like, do people go in person maybe and watch it at a theater? You know, we did. Uh, this was a fairly low budget uh, film. So we, we had a gala in October of last year it was in Houston. And, you know, it wasn't well publicized. And so we showed episode one. We recently had a, um, a screening. Um, uh, it was a. Uh, it was actually when we launched the full season, and it was uh, March 18th. And so again, it was done locally. We sent it out to our email list. We had a social media campaign, uh, so it did reach some limited eyes, and we had a pretty nice in-person screening. Uh, as we do future seasons, our budget increases. We'll have you know, say, broader screenings. We'll probably do some things around the country over time as we get the future seasons out. Is there any way to get it on any of the streaming services like Netflix or Amazon Prime? Not yet. Uh, it takes about six months for those guys to really get it. So now it's fully you know, uh, composed. Uh, our team is, uh, we have a consultant that's working with us because, you know, we have a closed captioning that needs to be finished and all of that stuff. So that'll be presented to them. That takes them about six months to get back to us. And so but we decided to put it out on an independent channel now. Uh, and so you go to uh, heartandsoulofachampion.com and you can get it. And it's on Vimeo OTT, which is a private channel. Uh, we'll eventually have it to where you can play it on your Roku and uh, Amazon on your TV as well. That's great. You know what everyone loves to know is what do you eat? <laughs> and because Christy's saying, can I get Dr. Montgomery's recipe for broccoli quiche? <laughs> Somebody knows about a broccoli quiche. I don't <laughs> uh, so the answer is uh, I pretty much um, in the morning, I'll have fruit. I'll have cold pressed juice or smoothie. I'll have a salad. You know, sometimes we have a sprouted rice. We have a gourmet raw kitchen. So we make things like, you know, gourmet raw pizza and, and various other things. And so 
Uh, I'll have those things in addition to, you know, routine salad. Sometimes I just keep it simple and just, you know, eat spinach and lettuce or kale or something like that. Nice. Do you work out as hard as you were doing it in the docuseries or was that just for the show? <laughs> that was largely for the show. The answer is yes, I do from time to time. I'm so busy with so many different uh, activities, running a, a business and growing our operations. So sometimes I, I may skip out for a few weeks, but I'm actually getting back into training because we have another uh, big uh, training and uh, a timing schedule for our athletes and some non-athletes in June. So uh, I'm starting to hit the uh, hit the workout uh, schedule pretty soon. Great. Thank you. Uh, Marley wants to know, aside from whole food plant-based, do you have any recommendations for someone with a high LPA? Yeah, a lot of protein light, I mean, there are different ways of getting it down. The the nutritional part has been the one way to show it to come down. Um, and, you know, of course, all these things are genetic and LP little is, is a genetic predetermination, but it's really the epigenetic. So you, uh, in our, our published data, we show, you know, the plant-based diet, a raw plant-based diet to reduce about 16% in just four weeks, which was you know, the, the first time it was ever done to be shown in, in nutrition. Uh, there are certain medications that's been shown to reduce it. Um, uh, the injectable uh, PCSK9 uh, inhibitors have been shown to reduce LP little a. Um, berberine is a natural PCSK9 inhibitor. I don't know if it reduces LP little a, but, you know, that may have a similar mechanism as the injectable uh, pharmaceutical drugs. Right. Thank you. People, we have a t very talented chef named Ross Chef Yin watching. She's very impressed that you have a gourmet raw kitchen. So come to the United States and work for Dr. Montgomery, Yin. <laughs> Good. Yeah, we'd love to have you. What is this broccoli quiche everybody's talking about? So this broccoli quiche, and I don't know the ingredients offhand. We invited a, a raw vegan chef, Chef India from Belize came over. She's been on my show. It was three years ago, but I know her. Yeah, she's done well. So she she came over and we I contracted her to uh, revamp uh, some of our recipes. And the broccoli quiche was one of the things that she added to it, uh, among some other things. So, yeah, she's she's done well. That's she's from the Los Angeles area originally. Wow, that sounds fabulous. Yeah, I remember I, you have we just I mean, where else can you go to the doctor and have a restaurant and a gym? Wouldn't it be cool if everybody was like that? That should be the wave of the future. That's the that's the purpose of the doctor series and the purpose of us making this uh, announcement. All right. Well, this was wonderful. And thank you for doing this series. I wish you every success with it. And hopefully people will buy it and check it out and watch it and share it with their loved ones. Well, thank you very much, Chef AJ. It's always a pleasure to visit with you. And of course, always a pleasure to come on your show. All right. So thank you so much, Dr. Montgomery. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for another spectacular plant-based doctor, Dr. Joel Furman.